Hello, and welcome to today's seminar on the use of ICG uh, in small animal in vivo imaging. My name is Seth Gammon, and I'm the product manager here at CareStream Molecular Imaging for our in vivo product line. Just to ground our discussion today, um, my, the imaging sciences really are unified in that you're always trying to find some interesting signal noise over a background, and then ascribe that signal to some interesting phenomenon, whether you're talking about microscopy, endoscopy, small animal imaging, human imaging, or astronomy. And the, but today we're going to, of course, focus on small animal imaging. Imaging is important because it allows, it gives really users the unique opportunity uh, to observe the true history of any disease or developmental process without significantly damaging uh, the animal. It's really, truly non-invasive. This allows you to conduct studies that you wouldn't otherwise be able uh, to conduct uh, using classic destructive ex vivo uh, molecular biology analyses. That does two things for you. It allows you to improve your statistical power using things like uh, paired t-tests. It also allows you to uniquely track the location and timing of some molecular event in vivo when you don't know ahead of time where it's at. Now, molecular biology feeds into small animal imaging quite nicely. So, for example, in standard molecular biology techniques, you're looking at things like fluorescent or chemiluminescent gels or Western blots to track protein expression levels or post-translational modifications, and sometimes enzyme activity. If you're looking at uh, immunofluorescence or live cell fluorescence using microscopy, you're trying to track some labeled uh, event within its location, non-invasively inside of a cell. Or you can scale up a little bit more and look at the overall population behavior of some cells in a 96-well plate. With molecular imaging, you now move that whole process in vivo, where now you're looking at changes in expression level or post-translational modification or cellular phenotype, and you're able to track where that occurs at the tissue level. You can also then co-register these uh, molecular or, or uh, events with anatomy using reflectance imaging or x-ray imaging. This is in contrast to classical, what I would just call phenotypic imaging or structural imaging, where you're looking at uh, just the bodily structure, which is important, but you're not getting any information about molecular events. At CareStream Molecular Imaging, all of our systems are designed such that you have really two things uh, going on in any given instrument. One is the ability to observe and study the physiology or anatomy uh, in your subject, whether that's by reflectance imaging or by x-ray imaging. You also want to then be able to detect a functional signal, and that is to utilize our fluorescent or luminescent or radioisotopic imaging capabilities to track a molecular event in vivo, see where it's occurring, and how that event is changing over time. The particular molecule that we're going to talk about today is endocyanine green, or ICG. And the modality we would use to track this would be near-infrared fluorescence. So the particular dye, the structure is indicated here on the right, is commercially available from a lot of different sources. You can see it has a significant extended conjugation, which helps it to both be excited and emit fluorescent light in the near-infrared. Exciting and emitting in the near-infrared is, is really quite important for in vivo molecular imaging because in the near-infrared you have maximum transmission of your excitation light and your emission light back out as well as minimizing the levels of endogenous autofluorescence that you might find. ICG in particular has a unique property where, as a fluorophore, it's already FDA approved for patient use. So the types of studies that you could conduct and the experiments uh, and data and results that you get from your small animal imaging experiments using ICG can be much more rapidly translated to the clinical setting uh, than with really any other fluorescent probe. Um, simply because it's in the near infrared and it's already been FDA approved. You wouldn't have to go through that process. Or you may not have to go through as much of that process. 
If we then take a look at some more of the optical properties of ICG, uh, here again we're looking at the absorption spectrum of ICG. As I said before, it absorbs in the near-infrared. At very dilute solutions, you see that there's a nice peak here right around 790 nanometers. As, this, as it gets more concentrated in solution, you actually start to see additional excitation peaks showing up uh, back around the 730, 740 range. Still in the near infrared, but not quite as far. Uh, this also tells us uh, that this particular probe at higher concentrations forms higher order aggregates. And so we really want to work uh, in relatively dilute solutions in vivo uh, if we want our signal to be as linear as possible. If we're not interested in linearity necessary, uh, necessarily, then working at higher concentrations is possible as well. The emissions are also nicely uh, situated in the near infrared. Here you see that the peak uh, is around 810 and continues to trail off far out into the near infrared. If you inject ICG into an animal, it rapidly clears from the bloodstream into the liver and from the liver into the excretory pathway. So you can see from three mice that were IV injected with ICG and then after they were injected placed into an in vivo MSFX Pro and the distribution of ICG uh, tracked over time. The next question is when using ICG, particularly again in dilute solutions, is there a linear response with fluorescence to, uh, to the amount of dye at the target site? And we tested this using two simple injections, uh, one with 20 micromolar or 200 picomoles of ICG at one site and then 20 picomoles at another, drawing regions of interest and then taking the ratio and seeing that in fact uh, you get a very nice uh, almost 10 to 1 uh, ratio of these two sites. Now particularly for any in vivo signal, this linearity really occurs only for things that are located at roughly the same depth within an animal. If you're looking at radically different depths within the animal, you would in fact expect to see uh, non-linearities or deviations from linearity. One of the most uh, common applications of ICG might be to look at regional lymph nodes. Let's say that you're uh, studying a small animal model for uh, tumor surgery. Surgeons often want to understand what are the regional draining lymph nodes, and in fact you can use ICG to model this quite nicely in a small animal. So if you inject ICG at a particular site, you can quite easily visualize the, the lymph nodes as well as track the lymphatic vessels. And because we're working in the near infrared, there's not a lot of background uh, available from other sites. And by co-registering it with X-ray, you have a lot of additional anatomical landmarks to help you go back in later and locate those lymph nodes. Other researchers took a slightly different approach. Because ICG binds to uh, serum proteins, at sites of inflammation where you have leakiness of the vasculature, you might expect that those serum proteins could collect at inflammatory sites and bring along the ICG with them. So to test this, uh, Meyer et al. conducted a uh, study where they had a surgery on rats and then injected them with and without different doses of ICG. They then quantified the signal uh, by normalizing it to the pre-injection autofluorescence, which as I said is minimized but not necessarily zero, and then imaged these over time so they could find the optimal time and dose for ICG for tracking inflammation. As you can see, just by looking at the uh, images in fluorescence mode, not co-registered with X-ray yet, there are two different peak times for, uh, for tracking the site of inflammation depending on the dose that was used. At the higher dose, you find the peak times much later, 15, 20 minutes out in the study. That's actually not quite beneficial for res the researcher's workflow because uh, animal handling fundamentally takes a little bit of time uh, between injection, uh, knocking an animal out, using isoflurane anesthesia, preparing it, putting it into the instrument. You actually want a little bit of buffer time in there uh, before you have 
have your peak of your signal. In addition to this convenient time uh, point, you can also see that working with the higher dose of ICG gives you a much better signal to background ratio than working with the uh, lower dose ICG. As I mentioned before, co-registering fluorescent signals with X-ray uh, really helps with landmarking and identifying where your signal is actually coming from. As we saw from these uh, images, fluorescent images before, you can tell that the signal is from the VEX Pro and its ability to accurately co-register fluorescence with X-ray signals. You can quite nicely see that these signals, in fact, are coming from the spinal area and can even localize uh, approximately to what vertebra these signals are coming from. They then went on to confirm that at these sites of high, high ICG uptake, there was in fact increase in local inflammatory cells such as macrophages. Now that they've worked out this ICG uh, protocol, they wanted to see if it was further extensible to other inflammatory processes like models of rheumatoid arthritis. So this group uh, induced uh, RA in the knees and ankles of rats and then utilized their previously determined protocol and injected these rats IV with 10 mg per keg of ICG. They then again went through and did the sequential imaging and quantified the data as they had previously. And in fact, once again, you can quite nicely make out significant increases in fluorescence uptake at the inflamed sites in both the knees and the ankle joints compared with the control. Running a control is always a critical part of any experiment, but for optical imaging uh, is, is just as important. And the large imaging area found in NVivo MSFX Pro up to 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters means that whether you're working with uh, many different mice uh, or, with, or with two rats, you can always get a control in the same field of view as the rest of your experiment. So it makes, it makes normalizing and understanding your data much easier. And besides just the pretty picture, it's always important to quantify your data, and in fact they did that quite nicely uh, by comparing the change in signal intensity in the arthritic joints to the control animal, and you can see a quite easily separated, uh, statistically significant difference in those joints. So now you can think about utilizing ICG, uh, which is a very conveniently uh, available fluorophore from a wide range of vendors for tracking all the different, many different types of processes where inflammation, uh, or really in particular, leaky vasculature are involved. And just as before, they went on to confirm ex vivo that there was uh, an increase in, in inflammatory cells at those sites. Other groups, rather than working just with ICG, have utilized ICG as a convenient fluorophore and packaged it up within other things like nanoparticles, in this case calcium phosphate nanoparticles, so that it could be more directly targeted. So rather than relying on the fact on the idea that you would just have to have leaky vasculature, this group wanted to take ICG, load it into nanoparticles, and then target those nanoparticles to different cell surface receptors. In this case, they were looking at ways to target these uh, calcium phosphate nanoparticles to tumors, and so loaded them with ICG, and then coated them with different potential targeting or uh, non-targeted agents, as you would see in, in, uh, in two here. And if you look at this data, they're really able to, in one nice, really in one nice shot, get all of their experimental and control animals in one image. And you can clearly see that the uh, targeted probes, particularly number three, have significantly different distribution than just ICG alone or just nanoparticles alone, uh, where nanoparticles can be taken up into tumors uh, to some extent through a process of enhanced permeability and retention. They also wanted to look at whether they were able to uh, induce these calcium phosphate nanoparticles to cross the blood-brain barrier. And so again, they already have their ICG-loaded nanoparticles, they have a nice negative control of the PEG-coated uh, nanoparticles, and then coated it with uh, other potential targeting agents and found that the gastrin uh, peptide caused it to be taken up into the brain quite nicely. 
Now a follow-up experiment that needs to be uh, done here is to in fact confirm that this got out of the end of out of the blood and in past the blood-brain barrier and into the brain. And that's something you have to really confirm by microscopy rather than just whole animal imaging. But at least you know you have a shot because you see a significant increase in fluorescence right here at the brain with the uh, gastrin-coated, uh, ICG-loaded calcium phosphate nanoparticles. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, you can always email us here at carestream, seth.gammon at carestream.com. Thank you.